In the rolling hills just outside of St. Louis, Missouri, there's a small hole two to three feet wide. Cave is repelled 58 feet into what's known as Crankshaft Cave. The cave gained notoriety back in the late 1960s when paleontologists removed Pleistocene faunal remains. The Pleistocene epoch spanned the time period from 2.6 million to 11,700 years ago. The climate was very different, so paleontologists gathered the fossil remains to study. In Crankshaft Cave, you descend literally on top of the old car parts that are scattered about the talus slope.
There are 130 Model T car parts scattered around the talus slope. And I must say it was a bit odd seeing it all there. Having some mechanical knowledge, I wasn't altogether familiar with Model T car parts or how Model T's worked. Photographs were taken of each individual part, along with clusters of smaller parts. We contacted a local Model T chapter in St. Louis, asking if they could help on identification of car parts, including the dates of manufacture. That way, we could have a time frame on when the parts would have been in use and perhaps when they were deposited in the cave. Yeah, it, you know, these are very interesting pictures, but it's showing parts, ripped fenders, uh, broken crankshafts, broken engine blocks. This, this particular one here, you can see the break in the engine block right through here. So, the, and this is all things, uh, Model T engine blocks were cast not giving any real time to rest before they were machined. You could be cast, machined, and in a car within two weeks, which is, back in that time, very hard on them engines. And it's very common to get cracks that can put these engines out of commission. Photo 14 shows a flywheel still attached to a broken crankshaft with another crankshaft laying across it. That's a dump. Uh, today, if that wasn't as rusted, that would be a good flywheel to scrounge the magnets off of. The flywheel was part of the magneto on the Model T. And you had 16 magnets which flew within 30 thousandths of the coil pack to create your spark power. And you would start it on battery and then flip it over to magneto where it would run much better because a magneto would make anywhere from 6 to 36 volts and the battery would only make 6 volts, period. Here's a fully disassembled block next to a broken transmission with the flywheel. And you can see fully disassembled. Uh, if somebody was trying to hide a car, they wouldn't fully disassemble us. They'd just throw it down. This is a broken bell housing. We call this a hogshead. And this is what goes over the transmission, holds the pedals. And you can clearly see it's broken in half. The parts back then were cheap plentiful. If you found, a, if you spun a bearing on your, on your, on one of your pistons, usually you could find a Model T somewhere that had been abandoned to take a piston out and just replace the one on yours. Uh, the Model T was built to be easily worked on and they are you can pull a head off clean up uh, clean the carbon out do a valve job in less than two hours on these engines they're very simple to work on model t historian noted uh, in one of the photographs of the engine blocks that there was a water port connection and in this particular model just above that water port is an area where the serial number was if by some miracle we could get the rust off, there's a possibility that we could read the serial number. And if we had the serial number of the engine, we can date it quite precisely down to the day it was made in some cases. We decided instead, rather than grinding off some of this rust or trying to clean it, 
to use a non-intrusive measure, a structured light scanner, to obtain the number. Structured light scanners work by projecting a pattern over an object. We then ana analyze how the pattern is distorted by the shape of the object, and that gives us a very uh, precise 3D rendering of the object. The number, as best we could read it, was 2645825. According to Model T historian and mechanic Stephen Thumb, the serial number indicated that the engine was built early in the third shift, April 23rd, 1918. sort of in the back of Crankshaft Cave. There's no other exit that, uh, uh, to the cave other than the, on the top. What we do see here are these bear claw marks in the, in the dirt here. Um, probably a bear that came in and did not leave. Why anybody would come all the way up here to dump car parts? To gain a better perspective on Model T car parts and how they work, I decided to meet up with Steven. We're interested in the Model T parts that were discovered in this pit, allegedly stolen. According to the current landowner, anybody that knew the true origin of the car parts in Crankshaft Cave is long gone. <laughs> The story that I heard was that the previous owners of the property disposed of them to hide them from the sheriff. Sheriff, who eventually hung one of them up by his thumbs in the barn that used to stand near here to get a confession out of him. Of 
course, that's all hearsay. Well, now, you know about the cave that we found uh, yes. uh, over there with these Model T parts. And legend has it this is, you know, bootleggers dumping uh, cars in there. And I wanted to ask you a question about a couple of the parts that we see in there because some of the things seem to me like they might really be diagnostic and the kinds of things you could tell something about. One of the things um, that we see are the, the hubs or the center part of these wheels. Now the spokes are largely gone. Um, is there anything about that that if you were to, to see a particular hub you could tell? No, because the hubs were pretty much the same from about mid-1909 through okay. till 27. They didn't change the hubs much. The only change they made is at first they had a straight axle and they went to a tapered axle on the back end. The front hubs, they changed them to go from roller bearings to the, uh, I mean, to go from ball bearings to the roller bearings. So that was the only real changes made between the hubs. So is there isn't a whole lot to see. The only thing that the big change would be is whether the outer ring, if that was still there, whether it's a demountable or a mount, mounted uh, wheel. And this is a demountable. This is the... a demountable. You have four bolts, which allows you, if you have a flat, to take the uh, wheel off and change a tire. The non-demountables, which were made up until 1919, this was pressed onto the wheel so that if you had a flat, you fixed it while it was still bolted onto the car. There was no way to just change it. Okay. Um, let's see, another thing we see are some fenders. Mm -hmm. And one of the surprising things for me, and of course I, I didn't really know that much about uh, Model T's before uh, looking into this, is that there were so many body styles that were made. Uh, would would fenders be something that would be diagnostic or? Well, there was different fenders made to fit different body styles on the rear fenders. The running boards and the front fenders uh, were pretty much the same, except there were some changes year to year. If you notice the older cars, uh, the front fenders will just go straight out. And you can tell what year by kind of the curve or whether there was a bill on front and little things like that. But, you know, fenders are fenders. And a lot of people back then, they didn't like the older brass radiator cars because then they just looked old. They wanted something that looked more modern. So they may change the fenders and the radiator on it to make it look more like the modern car, the newer ones that were coming out. And parts for these cars were just every there was over 15 million of them made they were just anywhere you looked there was an abandoned car just go take parts off of it one of the things that we saw there too was part of the engine part of the engine block and uh, maybe the heads mm -hmm. now I know there's some serial numbers on different parts let me show you The serial number on most of Model T's is on a flat place right above the water inlet. And I say most Model T's because the very early ones had it on the other side of the engine. But they soon, by 1912, they were all on this side and they, you know, all were right above, oh no, embossed right above the water inlet. And with that number, Ford kept very good records of engine builds. So we know by the number, the date that the engine was actually assembled. So you know, for instance, exactly the day that this, this engine was assembled? This, this particular engine was assembled on February the 20th, 1925. And by the way the numbers are, are laid out, this engine was probably built around mid-morning. Okay, how? Well, how was there was over 6,000 engines built. So you start with the numbers and oh, you just yes, go down by time. What about, uh, you were showing me some things before where you had different heads, especially before and after World War I, where you had different qualities of gasoline? Well, the very first heads was a very much lower head. It created a bigger horsepower. You had a 22 and a half horsepower because you had a four and a half to one compression. Right now, in 1917, he came out with a what's called the high head 
and lowered the compression from four and a half to four because the uh, gasoline started being mixed with with what they call coal oil back then. We call it kerosene today. And the ga gas power became considerably less, so they didn't, they weren't trying to avoid things like spark knock and that. Okay. So they, they lowered the compression ratio, which lowered the horsepower from two and a half to 20, and Ford just kept the same head through the rest of production then, because so the high head also had a larger water capacity, which cooled better. So one of the things we might be able to tell then is if you're looking at a pre-World War, well, pre-1918 yeah. uh, um, uh, engine or, or something after that. Correct. Okay. If one, you were... One other thing that you can look at, uh, if you come around on this side, you notice I have a generator there. Generators were not put on cars until 1919. And I have a casting that allows me to have the generator. Any engine before 1919 does not have any of the casting and does not have any ability to put a generator on it. If you were to find an engine sitting somewhere or when you're looking for an engine or parts, um, besides those two things, are there any other particularly um, interesting things that will tell you which year or whether you mentioned for instance some were built in Canada some were built in England well any part that Ford built in the United States will have somewhere on it made in USA uh, Ford was a big fanatic about that any part made in Canada will have made in Canada on it so okay. that's an easy diagnostic and you can see it right here made in USA made in USA and a Ford name mm -hmm. if it's a genuine Ford part it will have Ford and made in USA on it so the story the popular story behind this cave and now you've seen some of the pictures from that and, 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 uh, and we've talked a little bit about what we actually saw there um, the popular story that this was somewhere people were dumping stolen cars um, does that ring true at all, given what you see, given well, what you know about the parts? Chris, I grew up on a farm. Uh, my parents moved us out to a farm in 1960. Back then, even in the 60s, it was very common that if you had a hole in the ground or a good slope with a uh, ravine that needed to be filled in, that became a trash dump. And you have to understand that when this car was being made and even in the 30s uh, these were just an old car they were nothing special like they are today so consequently they wanted to get rid of the parts and they didn't have metal wasn't worth recycling the price of metal just wasn't worth trying to pick it up and recycle it back then so if they found a hole it was out of sight out of mind down it went and he in the 60s practiced that a little bit uh, we had a ravine that has my first 1961 Rambler Classic in it. After I wrecked it, I stripped the parts off of it, threw it in a hole. <laughs> yeah, we have a long tradition of that in Kentucky. And from the, the kind of parts, uh, one of the questions I had would be, what would be the kind of parts that would typically wear out and you would replace on a car? Engines, like transmissions, rear axles, those are common. And from the pictures everything, that I've seen. Everything that moves. Yeah. From the pictures that I've seen, I mean, this block, first of all, if they were going to take apart a car and try to hide it by throwing it in this hole, they wouldn't take the engine all apart like they did. they just take the whole thing and throw it down in there. You have just a plain block laying there. With and no it, head. Yeah, with no head on it, and it's broken. Now, the brake could have been from falling down, but it could have been broken beforehand. Uh, I see some of that with the axles that you have down in there. Why would they take apart an axle so that you don't have the actual mechanical workings inside if they're trying to hide evidence and throw the whole thing down? Yeah. That's what I'm seeing. Okay. Yeah. You know, and it's pretty easy to distinguish that from what would happen to a car sitting at the bottom of a sinkhole for oh yeah. 100 years. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. 
the head's not going to come off the block. Right. You know, yeah. in, in World War II, just being an old car, thousands upon thousands of these things were fed into the ovens for war steel. Which, if you see that footage today... It makes me cry. <laughs> it makes me cry. Yeah. Because we, we in the club do our best to preserve these cars to make it... This is a piece of history. This is primitive driving. This is actually 1908 technology. In 1908, this was a massive leap forward. But by 1927, it was terribly obsolete. And it's limited speed. I mean, top speed on this really pushing it is 50 miles an hour. It's comfortable to drive between 30 and 40. The Model A can do much better than that. And that's why people stop buying this is because it just was an obsolete car. And in terms of being a piece of history, this really was the beginning of this the automotive This made. car by itself. At one point, over half the cars in the world were Model T's. And this car by itself pulled the United States from horsepower to machine power. You could buy one, a Model T, for about the same price that you could buy a team of horses in a wagon. When you didn't need it for a few days, you could put it in a barn and forget about it. You can't do that with a horse. Horses have to be fed, watered, and cleaned up after every day, whether you use them or not. I step on the starter. Maybe I need to... Is this the starter? No, the no. starter button is, is right oh, here. Oh, right there. <coughs> I'm about to uh, try to drive a Model T, which uh, doesn't even really look easy when uh, those guys are doing it. So... I wish there was not so many things around here to hit. Although that's steering, I, I can actually probably get that part down. It's the, uh, this being the throttle. This being the gear shifter and this having a role in that as well. Well, we'll see. Cool. the Magneto? Yeah, just flip it over. Fast. Slip it fast enough. Now give it less gas. Pull the timing all the way down. All the way down. Less gas. There you go. Now you're idling in, in with a fully running car. All right, now lightly step down on the clutch. You brake with the other foot. Brake with your right foot, but you don't need to be braking right now. Give a little gas. Give a little gas. Go. Don't let that slide. You burn that throw up. So now what we need to do is to look at the cave as an archaeologist would, look at it as an archaeological site. And there are several questions which we're left with. If this was a trash pit, as Stephen suggests, then where's the other trash? 
Was this the only trash being produced in this area? The car parts are the only historic artifacts left in the caves. Where are all the other items you might expect if this were thrown into the sinkhole by, say, the local farmers? We asked our cavers what trash is typically recovered from sinkholes. Typically, when we, when we look at sinkholes, we think of sinkholes as having something in common with hollows or ravines. They're convenient places to dump trash. If you can't see it, it's out of mind, out of sight, all that. Uh, so when we clean sinkholes, we may find a little bit of trash. We may find a lot of trash. It can be one family's refuse. It can be the community's refuse. It can even be a regional refuse dump. We find tires, we find batteries, we find old spice uh, uh, fragrance bottles, we find dolls, we find furniture, we find rugs, we find appliances. I don't know if it's cheaper to dump it in a sinkhole versus driving it to a landfill or whether it was simply more convenient, uh, not as time consuming. But we find a lot of trash in sinkholes that are bad for the groundwater. Uh, it can change the pH of the water, it can change, uh, it can introduce a lot of pollutants into the water, which obviously affects your drinking water, my drinking water, your neighbor's drinking water, as well as the stigobites and phreatobites, the, the, the life forms that live in the groundwater. Uh, so it's, it's, it's bad for everybody. The other thing that we find is that the, the trash is usually an amalgam. It's whatever you threw away. Um, but one particular sinkhole, Turton Sink, which is in Lawrence County and is part of the Ozark Cavefish uh, recharge area, we found over 3,000 bottles of Old Spice. A lifetime of Old Spice? I mean, I don't know, but but certainly uh, that was unusual. We find lots of tires. Uh, the Goodwin sink cleanup, which we have uh, cleaned out probably 10 million pounds of trash altogether. That included 1,200 tires. So we're not talking about one person's refuse. We're talking about a whole regional landfill of some kind. Maybe even some businesses just got rid of some old tires that way. We don't know. I mean, how do you get 1,200 tires? And we know we haven't cleaned out all of the tires. Every time we, we do a cleanup trip in Goodwin Sink, we find more tires. Most of the trash that we're finding in sinkholes is probably less than 60 years old. Now, that's not to say that people weren't dumping things into trash a hundred years ago or a hundred and fifty years ago but certainly with the increase in population uh, in certain areas for instance the Ozarks uh, it's not as convenient to get rid of trash uh, in landfills as it once was people used to have regional landfills in a lot of places and with those landfills filled to capacity it's becoming more and more of a problem. When we compare these examples with crankshaft caves, we see that here we just have Model T parts. We don't have the artifact scatters of household goods and other refuse that you would expect. We're also unable to find any historic roads or homes around or near the cave entrance. So it seems that someone may have gone out of their way to discard the parts. The next step was to look at anything going on in this time frame related to criminal activity in the area. So we asked the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department if they could help us. The St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department provided us with information regarding automobile thefts during the 1920s. According to a police journal from March 28, 1923, automobile theft was on the increase in St. Louis. In this same article, the St. Louis police chief reported a total of 9,892 automobiles stolen between 1917 and 1923. About 20% of these cars were stolen to sell, to make a profit off of them, selling them or parting them out. 
About 35% were stolen for insurance purposes. About 5% were stolen by crooks to be used in the commission of other crimes. Holdups, burglaries, etc. Most were committed by people between the ages of 18 and 25. About 40% of the stolen cars were taken by youths for joyriding. Pamphlets were issued to the public with precautions to take in order to prevent your automobile being stolen. The biggest problem was leaving cars unlocked. A newspaper article in March of 1923 reported Police Chief O'Brien telling members of the St. Louis Automobile Clubs in an address that the department had special detectives seeking auto thieves and the whereabouts of stolen cars. He quoted Section 27 of the Motor Vehicle Laws, providing that all automobiles with the exception of commercial trucks shall be locked when left unattended on the highway and fixing the penalty for violation at a fine from... $5 to $500 or imprisonment in jail. The police chief goes on to mention making visits to various parts of the city and seeing cars with the keys in the ignition, as if inviting a thief to get in and drive away. Again, we spoke with Stephen Thumb about how people secured their cars from being stolen. Well, in the 20s, you could lock up the closed cars. They did lock up. And they had a key that opened up the passenger door. There wasn't a whole lot of different keys, and you could buy a skeleton key that would just open them up. Also, the ignition key on these, there's a four-key set that you can still buy today that'll start any Model T from the 20s there is. So, theft was a big, big problem. Uh, started a whole new industry, anti-theft devices for the Model T. Steering wheel locks. I had a car for a while. A 25 two-door coupe, uh, I'm sorry, two-door sedan that had a steering wheel lock on it. I had fun in the parades with it. I'd keep the steering wheel unlocked, and I'd pull up to a crowd, lift the steering wheel off its uh, gears, and just spin it. And ask people, how do I drive this thing? And then they'd get a funny look, and I'd drive off, push it, push it down. So that was one thing they had was steering wheel locks that would either lock it solid or lock it so you couldn't steer it. Uh, they had wheel locks, wheel chocks, they had all kinds of things trying to keep Model T's from being stolen. But just like today's cars, for everything that they come up with to keep your car from being stolen, the thieves find a way around it and steal them anyway. The third step was to look at any locations near the cave where other criminal activity was reported. We soon learned of a place called Biltmore Manor, which was only 10 miles from the cave. The Biltmore Manor opened its doors in the 1920 and served as a hangout for gangsters from then up through the 1950s. Unfortunately, the Biltmore burned down in the early 1970s, but we were able to talk with a few people who knew a lot about its history and who confirmed the criminal activity that went on. Now, the Biltmore was built on uh, two counties, Jefferson County and St. Louis County. Whenever the police would raid it, they would not go along with both counties at the same time, and they had pending information that they were coming. Supposedly there was tape down on the floor that showed where the county's line would be. And I guess from the police you couldn't cross over the line because you'd be in a different county. This allowed the patrons to continue to party and gamble.
So what was going on at Crankshaft Cave? Are there any truth to these gangster rumors? Well, we don't know. We do know that there are only Model T parts here. Possibly a dump for stolen cars or stolen car parts. Possibly a refuge pit for a mechanic. It's not a normal trash pit. This is where we use our skill as archaeologists to ask these questions and examine the data that we have and try to come up with the best answer that fits what we see. I feel that these parts came from some kind of a repair operation or you know somebody just fixing up some cars and that they get, were getting rid of old parts by down the hole. That was a big mindset back then. Once it went in the dump, they knew that they would eventually rust away and that it wasn't a big environmental thing. But environmental uh, protection wasn't nearly as big even in the 60s as it is today. I mean, we find whole cars in sinkholes sometimes. We find whole cars. Um, there was one motorcycle. There's a cave with a sinkhole entrance called Royal Enfield Cave. And it's named after the motorcycle, the Royal Enfield motorcycle. We find uh, there's one cave entrance in Tennessee where you go to the bottom of a trash-filled sinkhole and you unlock the car. The car is sideways. You unlock the car, crawl through the car, and into a cave. And that's how you get in. And that's how the cave is locked. When we began exploring Crankshaft Cave, there were a lot of unanswered questions, and there still are. We still don't know exactly what was going on here, but we do know that it's a unique and potentially historically important place. This project shows how we operate as archaeologists, combining archaeological observations, interviews with people, and historical research. We're a little closer to an answer here. For now, however, Crankshaft Cave still has its share of mysteries. Could he keep a woman like me? 